start. Uh, yeah, go ahead. All right. So thank you for giving me this possibility to talk. Uh, I never did it before online, so I actually not sure in my connection as well, but hopefully you can hear me. Anyway, so my talk is substantially simpler than the Eric's one, so it's, it's mostly trivial. And maybe even for those of you who are not experts, you may gain something, hopefully. That's, but at the same time, it's, it's just model-based. So I will talk indeed about uh, interactions, magnetic interactions, and some magnetization dynamics, microscopic magnetization dynamics in mostly in rush per magnets or in systems with strong spin orbit interaction. So it's conducting magnets, itinerant magnets. And um, this talk is basically designed to advertise mostly the works of Ivan Ado, who is about to defend his PhD thesis. So, and I will talk first about um, non-collinear magnetism and interactions in some systems, uh, which are called multi-spin chiral interactions. So I will just try to advertise this terminology. And in the second part, I will talk about the particular model of microscopic model of magnetization dynamics and what you can learn from it compared to phenomenological models, <clears throat> which you all maybe know to some extent. So let me start with this uh, multi-spin, what the hell is a multi-spin chiral interaction, right? So the story dates back to the lashinsky mori interaction, which you also very well know very well. That's the interaction between basically neighboring atomic spins, which is, has a form of anti asymmetric exchange or anti-symmetric exchange. And that is responsible, obviously, when D is large, D vector, the lashinsky mori vector is large, uh, can be responsible for frustrated magnetism, etc. So that's, that's an old story. So now people study a lot or observe uh, the structures which are kind of chiral magnetic structures. We, we can even coin the term chiral magnetism, which are basically helical objects, skirmions, magnetic varices, etc. So all these objects are different from frustrated magnetism because they have a long range order. Simply this long range order is not, not collinear. For example, it can have a skirmian crystal, it can have a helixes, etc. And typically the period of a helix or the, the typical size of magnetic vertex or skirmian is large compared to unit cell, right? To lattice spacings. So you better describe magnetism here in terms of Ginzburg-Landau energy functional, which is also called micromagnetic energy. It's a free energy in terms of expressed, in terms of the, <clears throat> um, in terms of the field, which is a continuous field M, rather than individual uh, spins, atomic spins. So you basically take a continuum limit. You also assume here that you are deep in ferromagnetic regimes so or basically model SAM is one, so below TC, so, so. so you know that you are ferromagnetic. And then uh, your DMI, for example, for a cubic system with broken inversion symmetry, your DMI interaction, the mori interaction can be written in this form, which is very well known, it's M dot rotor M. And, the, and as you can see, it's a second order in spin in M, but it's a first order in gradient, unlike uh, exchange stiffness, uh, which is second order in gradient. And then uh, the presence of such term leads to instability towards, for example, a helix. And that has been, of course, observed a long time ago by Ishikawa. And, um, sorry, I, uh, yeah. Uh, in 76, for example, the helical structures and also in the same material manganese silicon, uh, silicon uh, you observe skirmian crystal by Mühlbauer, the first observation in 2009, and you have many works of similar, of similar physics can be observed in many other materials like, like here. So one may be, okay. And that is what I call already, wow. Uh, 
So this bulk DMI I would already call two spin chiral interaction because it has two spins and one derivative on the level of micromagnetic energy. So that's my terminology. So it, this term doesn't necessarily come from original DMI, actually most probably not. So this terms, first of all, the chiral magnetic structures are observed mostly in itinerant magnets. And uh, this term, originates more in this exchange mechanism through conduction electrons, and conduction electrons must have spin orbit interactions, and you have, you have such terms arising, right? So this mechanism reminds you basically RKKY interaction, Rudiman Kittel Kasui, you see the interaction, and that simply can produce the same mechanism, can produce long range asymmetric and direct exchange or long range TMI simply due to spin orbit interaction of conduction electrons. So that's something which is also very well known after the works of Smith and Ferret in 70s, 80s. <clears throat> anyway, so that's kind of a history. And now people are more interested also, more interested also in two-dimensional magnetism, uh, and which is usually absorbed in some bilayers, multilayers, cobalt platinum. It involves necessarily heavy metal to provide the strong spin orbit interaction of conduction electrons, and this conduction electrons will then induce this uh, indirect exchange of that type, and that uh, leads to instability of the collinear order, and you form non collinear order. So, in two dimensions, it might be just inversion symmetry breaking due to interface because you put your material on platinum or, or whatever, on tungsten detilorite, or, or it might be just a material like this firm germanium telluride with strong spin orbit interaction. And then, uh, which is a conducting material. <clears throat> and then you, for example, have this, what is called interfacial DMI. So that's already a different one differs by symmetry, yeah, because it's, it just appeared due to the broken Z to minus Z symmetry, that is perpendicular to the <clears throat> two-dimensional plane. And then, again, you have a competition be between anisotropy and this DMI, and then if DMI is sufficiently large, you have your skirmion lattice, skirmions, etc. And there are many, many papers on that. So that's all you probably know. Anyway, now, what is our contribution to this? So, uh, of course, uh, we've been interested in this type of physics from a different perspective, but nevertheless, when we entered the field not many years ago, right, we started with a very primitive example, with a very primitive exercise. So, if you want to understand where the storms come from, let's do at least some elementary exercise, which I don't know why, but nobody did before. And this exercise is the following. So you just consider rush by electrons. So those are electrons, two-dimensional electrons, this spin orbit interaction of rush by type, P cross sigma, and some exchange to your, to your field M. So M describes localized spins, right? That's some kind of field, which is normalized to one. And you have some general kinetic energy, general maybe just general rush, but slightly generalized rush by. So in the original butchkov rajbo model, you have quadratic dispersion here, and this coefficient is one, so you have linear spin off. That's low P limit. So anyway, so what uh, you're going to do, you're going to take the electrons and compute grand potential density of the electrons in the presence of some profile of M of R. So, so M depends on, on coordinate. And then you expand this grand potential gradients and gradients of M. So if you, if you take this linear gradient, you obviously get the scalar interaction, so DMI. If you have second gradients, collect all second gradients, you get exchange stiffness, right? So those are your parameters of your ginsburg landau theorem, from, which come from electrons, or corrections to these parameters, right? From electrons. So that's what we do. It's, a, it's essentially following this formula for the grand potential textbook form. And indeed, if you take a limit of small spin orbit interaction, so you take alpha to zero, this alpha is the strength of Rajba coupling, 
then, uh, well, you need to, to you get D, which is a linear, which requires alpha, which requires spin orbit at least once, so it's, it's a linear in alpha, and you have exchange stiffness, which doesn't require spin orbit at all. So you have this general formulas actually expressed through these functions and through Fermi functions on two uh, Fermi surfaces. Now you can write the, them in this nice compact way using derivative of the SD exchange coupling. But um, anyway, and somehow you can check that actually this formula for A nicely reproduced from the classic formula which is, for example, cited in the Sriya view by Gus Nelson, Liechtenstein, and others. So we are kind of certain that what we are doing is, is consistent with what people did before, or actually a long time before. Anyway, it's anyway useful to plot this D, which you find here. So, so far, everything is just very dull. So if you plot it for Rajpa model, it's just a model with P squared and one here. So you actually find, and that actually many people don't know, I don't know why, but you find zero here in the upper band. So if you put your chemical potential above delta SD, so in the metal regime where you have two Fermi surfaces, not in half metal, then you actually have zero for both for D and for A, and actually for all, and even not in linear order with respect to alpha, but in all orders with respect to alpha. Uh, and that is also interesting, but it's kind of a coincidence because this uh, constellation, this massive constellation, follows from quadratic dispersion. Because in the quadratic dispersion, your density of states on two Fermi surfaces appear to be constant and it's the same constant. Um, anyway, so, so that is um, observation. So you only have a finite, say, DMI in the half metal region. Now, and it also tells you that, uh, that okay, it's been orbit direction is nice, but it's not a sufficient condition to provide you DMI. So you may have strong spin orbit interaction of conduction electrons and zero DMI. Easy. But uh, if you, of course, deviate from a quadratic dispersion, for example, become a little bit quartic, then you immediately re restore some fine edema here in the metal regime. What is also interesting is that here before you had zero, and actually before in this bichkov rajbo model, you had this nice relation between it's proportional to D or D proportional to exchange stiffness. Uh, but here now, if I had arbitrary quartic dispersion, I have similar proportionality, but with a minus sign in the metallic regime. That's kind of fun. <clears throat> anyway, that's all just model games. And the same happens when I add nonlinear Rajput interactions, so it deviates from one, this constant. So I see that uh, so it's kind of saturates with momentum. And then I also immediately obtain finite D minus the upper band in the metallic region. Anyway, so that, that's just an exercise. But this exercise can be extended. And that can be extended uh, beyond lowest order in spin orbit interaction. And it's very easy. You actually analyze this again, the density of free energy and this, and you see that linear ingredient terms appear to be a bit more involved if you go beyond spin orbit interaction. So your result has this following general structure. So you have a one function, which depends on mz squared, because that is the selected direction, which is selected by spin orbit interaction. And you have such a vector form where you only act here on perpendicular component of magnetization vector. And here you only act, gradient acts only on parallel component of magnetization vector, and there is a different function in front of it. So it's both kind of anisotropic DMI, but it's also multi-spin one, because now if I start expanding these functions in mz squared and use maybe integration by parts, I produce lots of terms. And the first term will contain, of course, will contain, of course, two spins, single gradient, but that will contain four spins, single gradient, six spins, single gradient. And that's where my terminology comes from, that, that is a DMI. 
my Lipschitz invariant, that's two spin chiral, and that's four spin chiral, six spin chiral, etc., etc., etc. So, of course, we've seen already that when alpha is small, when spin orbit interaction is small, I only basically have D2, and these guys I can disregard. Those are just high harmonics, and they're small. But nevertheless, here in this model, I have two parameters if I'm in the half metal regime. I have two parameters delta SD, which is a kind of a SD exchange effective exchange, exchange between conduction electrons and localized momentum and another energy scale, which is spin orbit energy. And if those are of the same order, then uh, actually all these coefficients, d2, d4, d6, d8, are of the same order. And so it's not clear why I have to keep this term, but disregard all other terms. So, okay, you can ask a question whether, okay, maybe it's only for the small, but I, I doubt that this, if this is only console this small. I think it's rather general. And indeed, for this model, which is we considered, okay, you place mu in half metal, a bunch of rush, but to get something, something uh, finite, right? And you already see that d4 of d2 is of the rule of one. And for example, if you just analyze the domain ball energy, the contribution of the scalar interaction to domain ball energy, energy, you take, for example, the simplest domain wall, which is just interpolation between block and nail, you see that this coefficients d2 and d4 enter on equal ground to this domain wall energy. So it's again not clear why you only want to keep d2 and throw away d4. That's one thing. And there is actually one comment here, which is kind of a technical lesson, which you also can can have from this exercise and this technical lesson the following when you analyze the strengths in micromagnetic energy which are linear and gradient you are basically computing some kind of tensors here response tensors and that uh, the tensor uh, is there uh, you need to compute for all directions of m and why you need to compute for all directions of m because actually because of due to the constraint I'm a close wire, there is a part of the tensor, for example, this one, which appears here, an alpha and beta, which obviously doesn't give you a contribution at all to the energy because of the constraint, because derivative of m squared is always zero. And that means that if you compute one component of the tensor for one direction of m, you actually don't gain anything, right? Because I can always add arbitrary large or arbitrary thin of that structure to my tensor and then my physical result doesn't change but the tensor changes. So you have to be a bit careful when you, for example, if you want to do it numerically, you would like to do structure and then figure out gauge transformations that means that only these two coefficients are physical and that one is unphysical. So that is important. Um, now coming to symmetry analysis. So this uh, story of DMI is also famous, yeah, because uh, if I start with two spins and one and one derivative, I can always anti-symmetrize into the integral. So the, the plus here will give me full derivative under the integral. So it's boundary term, but the bulk terms always have minors and those are called Lipschitz and variants after Lipschitz. And examples of the Lipschitz and variance why they arise in micromagnetic energy functionals. You can also analyze it on the basis of symmetry or actually rotational symmetry of your crystal. So you can, uh, for example, for point group rotations, C and O, tetrahedral to octahedral, you have uh, this collection of Lipschitz and variance, which is invariant, and then this collection can be added to the micromagnetic energy and that produces you the famous bulk DMI. So that's M rotor M. Now, if you have this uh, point group, basically you break inversion with respect to, to the plane, Z to minus Z, so it's kind of limit C infinity V. Then you have this two combinations of this two Lipschitz invariants, which remains invariant at the point group transformations. 
and that gives you the centrifugal gamma, and so on and so forth. You can do it for all different point groups. And that has been done by Bogdanov and Oblonsky. He first described how to do it. So if you redo the work, you will actually notice that there are three special point groups, uh, which uh, C3H, T3H, and TD. And these two are more two-dimensional. That's more, that's the rotations of T-trider. So, so that's, uh, they actually cannot write any single Lipschitz on the brain. They are forbidden by symmetry. And therefore, your chiral interaction, but nevertheless, because also groups with broken inversion symmetry, your chiral interactions start with four spins. And there is an example here, which I give for TD, because also more complicated. So for example, I can consider octired and tetrider groups, or rotational groups for octiders, which are all, I mean, have common chiral tetrider symmetry. And, uh, for actors, for example, I have M rotor M, which is about D mi, and I have two four spin interactions possible by symmetry. I don't give you full classifications. It's, it's very complicated. And uh, even though we did it, but for TD, I have no two spin chirals, so no D mi. But I have four spin chirals, so I have four spins and one derivative. So that is about D mi, and that's a new interaction, which is called other interaction after Ivan Ado, who discovered it, and as a four spin chiral interactions. So what, what would be the role of it, right? And uh, for example, if I just take a TD magnet, so that's a magnet with this uh, crystalline symmetry of any of the six uh, crystalline groups, uh, I, I will have a basically universal free energy, uh, macromagnetic energy functional, which will contain cubic anisotropy, which will contain uh, uh, it's a kind of four spin other interaction. And that is chiral because it has only one gradient. And that's similarly to DMI that leads to instability. So you just analyze it very quickly and you see that it definitely leads to instability with respect to formation of a helix. And again, it's a competition between K and B. Basically for small K, you have helix as a ground state. And again, the period of a helix is A over B. So that's Q0 is a the, the factor of the helix. And also, even if you don't have instability, you still, uh, this interaction also can be detected from specific anisotropy of magnet dispersion. I have no time to show it, but anyway, it is there. Because it's, uh, it's highly anisotropic. Current interactions, so it splits magnet bands. Anyway, so, so that's a lesson of this part, and I, I'll quickly uh, finish with this first part. So it's basically, there are multi-spin current interactions that may arise in the magnets. They are analogous to DMI stabilizing non-collinear magnetic order, but they differ from DMI because of the high anisotropy of spin wave dispersion, and two spin current interactions do not exist. So usual DMIs do not exist in point groups T, D, C, S, H, D, C, H. Okay, so, so that's it. So now, what's about non-equilibrium? So there was no non-equilibrium, and the topic of a conference is obviously non-equilibrium magnetization. So I, I come to here briefly to non-equilibrium magnetism. And here again, I choose to describe uh, non-equilibrium from a D-like model, but it's a particular sd like model, which consists of classical Heisenberg model, consists of tight bonding, electron model with spin orbit interaction and disorder, just the usual potential disorder, and local exchange coupling between this Heisenberg and, and spin orbit and, and tight bonding model. So why is this, uh, this model is interesting? That's because it's a minimal model where you have dissipation of angular momentum. And dissipation of angular momentum have some microscopic mechanism for dissipation is very much important if you want to discuss non-equilibrium magnetization dynamics from the microscopic point of view. And that is, here it's provided by a combination of this interaction. Sorry? So I hope you hear me, maybe not. Uh, Misha, we hear you. I, I, but there's a, a, a voice in the background every once in a while. I don't know what that is, but uh, keep on going. 
All right. So, so okay. So, so this channel, which is a, for dissipation of angular momentum from the lattice, is, is the following. So you, you angular, uh, you localize spins exchange basically angular momentum with the, with the spins on uh, of conduction electrons. But spins of conduction electrons are not. To orbital angle momentum because of spin orbit interaction, but uh, usual momentum, orbital momentum is not conserved because of impurities. So eventually, scattering on impurities not only lead to final, to finite conductivity, finite resistance of your system, but also it leads to a finite spin lifetime, right? Or to dissipation of of um, uh, of uh, angular momentum of localized spins to the lattice. So that contains this particular mechanism due to spin orbit and NSD exchange. And also, of course, when you apply electric currents, I will consider non-equilibrium formulation when I apply electric current or electric field, which is time dependent. Then, uh, then of course, you can gain angular momentum from the lattice due to the same mechanism. So now, now because it's an open system and it's a dissipative system, and it's very important that it's dissipative, you cannot deal with free energy functional. So you cannot just describe it by free energy functional. Instead, you just directly, unfortunately, go on the level of equation of motion. And you write equation of motion for localized momentum. And again, it will be in continuous approximation. You will see that it's coupled. So that will be effective field from Heisenberg mode. And that will be uh, as polarization or just average spin of conduction electrons from the abandoned mode. And this conduction electron spins from Tagbari model, I will write first in the linear and bilinear response theory. So I will find the response to S from electric field, bilinear response to electric field and gradient of M. So M is a field which depends on both time and R. Also response to derivative of M with respect to time and maybe also response to derivative of M with respect to R, which is actually, okay, in Carl interaction, you can check that this response you can reproduce from the previous analysis by going on the level of equation of motion rather than free energy functional. So to take a functional derivative from your here. Now, and all the stands are so complicated, right? Because for example, all of them are dissipative, at least the three. So they depend on tau and some relaxation processes and they can have dissipative, non-dissipative components. So it's Basically, you have to analyze them as you analyze conductivities. And, but they are more complicated than conductivity, all of them, and especially this one, which contains four vertices. And uh, what is very important when you analyze this type of things, it's, a, it's very important to be consistent. So if you work in diffusive approximation for conduction electrons, right, it's a kind of druder, approximation, leading approximation for large temperatures for a Fermi tau much larger than one. Then uh, you have to be consistent by it in what's called vertex correction or diffusion layers to your diagrams, which is not so important in conductivity, but here it becomes terribly important for spin because obviously your spin can live actually forever if you have no spin orbit and that you can only see when you add diffusion layer. So, and that is a direction of M. Because again, all the stances have huge gauge freedom due to the constraint in M equals one. And co computing some components of the stanza for some direction of M just, just totally meaningless. So these two points are very important. And because be if you don't fulfill them, you just get nonsense. And Again, I consider an exercise, and this exercise is the simplest possible exercise which you can do, and that is there, and nobody did it before, I don't know why, and that is there, again, rush per moral way, I now add electric field by vector potential, and this M is a field which also depends on IT. And now I only work in metal regime. I even avoid half metal regime where I have finite demo. I only work in metal regime where everything is totally trivial because it's quadratic dispersion. So I have DMI zero, anomalous hole effect zero, spin hole effect zero, everything is zero. And nevertheless, even though it's such a trivial limit, it's still quite not trivial calculation. And it's, uh, it gives you, okay, the spin, so we analyze the three tensors, you compute them exactly, 
in diffusive approximation by summing up letters and so on, by analyzing symmetries, etc. Consider DC limit even zero frequency of uh, electric field, so it's a total DC current. So due to vertex correction and when you analyze gauge symmetries of all tensors, you actually find the relation after this between this what we call spin transfer torque tensor and Gilbert damping tensor. So spin transfer torque is, a, is a basically spin transfer across the domain block. So you assume that your magnetization changes in plane, right? And that uh, from one point to another, so maybe because of the domain wall, and when you apply current, it's electric field, your electrons cross the main wall, and then there is a spin transfer torque, but it's in plane spin transfer torque. It's not between different materials, it's not perpendicular to the plane, it's in plane. Well, that's of course a gradient expansion. It, it has limited, uh, limited. Uh, you cannot not apply it when your M changes on atomic scales, obviously, magnetization. So, so that, is a, that is a really universal relation which you obtain here. And that is why it's important, it will become immediately clear. The E is electron charge, tau is this uh, scattering time of conduction electrons, M is the effective electron mass here. So what, why this relation is important? Because it establishes the, the relation between your Gilbert dampings here and spin transfer torques in your microscopic LG equation. So if you work it out, you get this microscopic LG equation. So something happens, something comes, effective field comes from interactions in Heisenberg mode. You have spin orbit torque, which only exists here in the form of the field like Rajba spin orbit torque. That's just Rajba field. J is just electric field. There is no spin current or electric current. There's no spin current here. I don't need to introduce spin current. We just directly derive uh, LG equation as a reaction to electric current. So I, I take this electric field replaced by, I also compute conductivity and take electric field replaced by uh, electric current by inverse conductivity tensor. So the Sloan derivative appears everywhere. So it appears that this universal relation between these two tensors, which I showed here, is responsible for the Sloan derivative in LLG equation. So it is there always, whenever I have, uh, whenever I have, for example, here Gilbert dumping, so M cross T over DT, I also have a similar term M cross V dot nabla M. And again, I have this anisotropy, and, I have, and again, I have this multi spin contributions because those are some complicated functions of MZ squared. So, so that's, that's a symmetry structure of what I have here. So of course, these two guys, parallel and perpendicular, is also dissipative. You can count powers of M here and see that those must be dissipative. And this is just a renormalization of M, partially. So this is a non-dissipative contribution. Also called, uh, it's, it's a combination of renormalization of spin due to electron spins and and, and uh, adiabatic, uh, adiabatic uh, torque. Anyway, so let me speed up and, and basically say that because of that, there is a very obvious consequence. If I look at the solution of the LG equation in the form of our tomorrow, so I only consider, consider kind of depends of I and T such that it depends on the combination I minus V dt, so you assume that my magnetic texture moves with the drift velocity of classical drift velocity of conduction electrons. Then I have indeed, so I just get rid of all these psi terms and I am back to just uh, equation with only field-like contributions. So M cross some effective field. So the Z cross J can be added to. Oh. So all your Gilbert time dissipation terms are canceled exactly by spin transfer torques. So basically that tells you already that in the limit, if you wait long time, you apply current. If your magnetic textures are not broken by current, current is not very large, then all your magnetic textures will move and rotate, all spins will rotate, but magnetic textures will move as a whole with the velocity given by drift velocity of conduction electrons. So that's a proof, at least in this moment. 
Now, another observation that uh, if you have zero spin orbit interaction, you throw away channel of dissipation of angular momentum. And therefore, indeed, uh, you can check it that your quantity psi naught becomes actually the ratio of, of uh, spin density of conduction electrons in equilibrium, period cell, and magnetic moment of localized spins. So basically, and the entire LG equation you derived will be just angular momentum conservation. So it's reduced to angular momentum conservation. So it's correct, at least on the limit of vanishing spin orbit interaction. I can demonstrate it. But now when I switch on spin orbit interaction, so this thing which is called psi naught first increase, but then drops suddenly to zero when spin orbit interaction exceeds SD exchange. And this guys become strongly isotropic. For example, parallel component be, uh, remains large, perpendicular component immediately disappears. For perpendicular, so C is cosine C is MZ. So that is what, for example, you can see. Anyway, so you also can, it's instructive to compare it to phenomenological logy equation. And you introduce here xi naught, which is now effective spin normalization. When you switch on spin orbit interaction, that's no longer spin density of conduction electrons, it's something else. It's no longer equal to delta S of conduction electrons. But uh, nevertheless, you can say, okay, it's effective spin normalization. I can, I can rewrite this equation in such a way that I put part of this TT on that side and introduce here and divide by one plus xi naught, introduce here something like spin current. So the spin current will be like each electron moves with drift velocity and carries some kind of angular momentum delta SF with respect to the total angular momentum S plus delta SF. So you say angular momentum from conduction electrons, some effective angular momentum delta SF. And then indeed you write it in the form of phenomenological G equation and JS will be kind of spin current only that it's defined in a very peculiar way because you have a certain formula for delta SF. But, uh, uh, but, uh, and you, and also alpha parallel and alpha periodical are functions. So it's n here, but n is m, are functions of mz squared. So that's, that's the thing. Anyway, so that's, that's the end. And basically what, what I wanted to tell you that in 2D Rajba ferromagnet, all magnetic textures move on the action of DC current with the same velocity and this velocity is equal to classical drift velocity of conduction electrons. So it doesn't matter if you have domain wall skirmion vertex or whatever, it will move with the drift velocity. And also this universal velocity of magnetic touches is kind of consistent with giant anisotropy of spin transfer torques. So even though spin transfer torques is very much anisotropic, it doesn't matter. And, uh, and anyway, there is a technical point that to be, to derive this, uh, story to derive this long derivative and so on, the structure to obtain the structure of LG equation, which is nobody obtained before, you have to be consistent, right? And you have to analyze all those diagrams consistently in the diffusive approximation. That's nobody did. And uh, anyway, and all components of response tenses, all components of response. Why? Okay, and all, comp uh, for all directions of M must be analyzed before one gets to any physical result. So thank you for your attention.